So just more pictures. Understanding of death. So now the adolescent, this is really neat. Um, abstract thinking, you know, there's, there's only about 40% of the population actually does abstract thinking, okay? So not everybody does. So it's very, you, you get some times where people are very concrete, means they're very black and white thinkers, or the abstract thinkers are some of those, the people that you think that are outside the box sometime and have all these kind of just, you know, maybe grand ideas about things. And so when kids hit this, around 12, 13 years of age is when kids, if they're gonna be an abstract thinker, they become an abstract thinker right around this time. So they start understanding what mortality is, okay? They say that, that I am mortal, I'm not gonna live you know, forever and stuff like that. Um, their reaction is influenced by their emotional struggles and by intellect, okay? So if you have a kid who is hitting puberty and they're having trouble fitting in with their peer group and then they experience a loss, Okay? that's going to make them feel even more alienated from their peer group. Okay? It's by their own emotional struggles. If you have a kid who is very stable, everything's good, they're doing very well, and somebody dies, they're going to be sad by it. They're going to go through the bereavement process, but it's not going to be so emotionally damaging. Okay? Um, if you have... Uh, actually, I have lots of examples. It's, it's interesting. So I, have, I had uh, a one girl who was a teenager who was very interesting. She'd been horribly you know, molested when she was younger, sexually molested and stuff. And so when the person who had molested her died, she had this sense of relief and felt so good. Okay? It was like, oh. But then about two years after that, her mother was the one who had, you know, when all this had, had been found out, her mother protected her and was wonderful with her. And then when the mother died, she was just completely distraught and just didn't know what to do because it brought up all those old emotions again because her protector was now gone. And so she had a recurrence of all her PTSD symptoms and all the trauma, the nightmares, flashbacks, all started coming back. Okay? So that's why when it's uh, influenced by their own emotional struggles, you gotta remember where's the kid now? And then it's kind of like a death or a loss happens and it throws them into turmoil. You can get them back to that same spot again. Okay, but it's gonna be sometimes a little bit of time. Um, most know that death happens to them, it's, that it's uh, irreversible, and, but a lot of them, even though they say death happens to me, and we know this can happen to people, they still see themselves as invulnerable, and they'll be like, still do risk-taking behaviors and stuff that's kind of not smart. Um, they also understand that death isn't caused by their actions or behaviors. That, you know, it would be like, remember earlier when I said the magical thing, and a kid says, you know, Dad, I hate you, I wish you were dead, and then the dad dies, the kid thinks it's his fault. They now say that this isn't like no more magical thinking where they say, you know what, if something tragic happened, that was tragic, but it was not my fault. And they start to understand a little bit um, about that. And then they worry about the future. This is the group where they worry about what's going to happen to me. You know, and it may sound a little bit selfish, but they're kind of like, am I going to have to move? Am I going to have to leave my whole support structure, my friends? Um, am I going to be able to go to college, like I mentioned earlier? So they're about finances and relationships. Um, kids who have cancer, teenagers who have cancer, let's say teenage girls who have cancer, like 16-year-olds, what do you think their biggest concern is? When you survey them all, what do you think their biggest fear about getting cancer is and getting treated? Losing their hair, because that's their social status or whatever. That is their biggest concern. It's not like, do you worry you're gonna die from the cancer? I'm worried about the chemo making my hair fall out. Okay, and so it's actually fun when I get girls who do that because I always try to bring a little bit of humor into it because that's my way of gauging how my kids are doing. Okay? If I have one of my kids that I can't even get them to smile at me or laugh at me, then I know that, that there's something else because they all know me that I'm, I will joke and I will tease them and stuff, but they know that I just I really care about all my patients and stuff like that. And so when I joke about the baldness, okay, I'm like, it's not so bad. Look, it's not so bad. And then they'll smile at me, and then that actually creates this rapport that it opens up, and they're like, yeah, but you're old. And I'm like... Gee, thanks. And so then they're like, I didn't mean that. And so what it does is you start this relationship that we then start teasing each other. And I can say, so tell me, what, what are you still worried about the hair? I'm worried that no boy will ever like me. Ah, okay. Well, then let's address that. Because you losing your hair is not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what the worry behind the hair is. Okay, so that's why you always make sure to take it a little bit further. But if they ever pause, never force them. You just say, okay, we can talk about that another time. Um, so what do you do with the adolescents? Considering their age, okay, figure out how big of a deal it was. Um, meaning, sometimes you may have somebody who says, oh, my uncle died, and like, well, how often do you see him? I haven't seen him in 10 years, but they're terribly distraught. Okay, then that makes me think, what else is going on in your life? This is just, that was a spark. 
that created something else. So you really have to look and say, look at all the factors involved. Um, become familiar with their culture, religion, or background. Understand where they're coming from. Say, well, what does death mean to you? What do you think happens? Where do you go from there? And then you approach it from that standpoint as opposed to saying, let me tell you my views about death. Here's what I believe. Because then they're going, we're different people. I mean, you know, it, it's, we have different backgrounds, different cultures. Um, be available, not overpowering. And, and be factual and try not to give your opinion. Tell them what happens and ask what they say. And I always say that, you know, five minutes of silence with these kids sometimes is more important than five minutes of you telling them what to do. Okay, they just want somebody to sit there and you say, I'm here for you. If you need me, let's talk. And you just sit there quiet. And then they'll talk when they're ready to talk. But you have to give them, you have to give them the, the avenue to be able to talk. And these are other ones that I like. That one you've already seen, but I just, I like all the little clip art. So those paintings, drawings. Okay, so talking about death, what are you going to do? Be a good listener. Kids talk to people that they feel they can trust, okay? If they don't think they can trust you, then find somebody else to talk to them, okay? And part of that may come from past things, like if, uh, let's say if, uh, you know, a parent dies and there's an aunt who the kid's like, every time I tell them something, they run and tell the rest of the family, well, they're not going to talk to that person, okay? And so they're going to talk to who they can trust. Okay, for us, you know, it is, you know, either doctors, therapists, everything else, is if you have a kid that comes in and they say, I want to tell you something about how I feel about this, but if they know that you're going to run tell the parent without asking the kid's permission, they're not going to tell you things. So sometimes if I have a kid that says something and they're like, well, I don't really want to say that to my parent, and I say, well, I think that's important. How about we tell your parent together? Would that be okay? And I can be in here with you. And almost always they're like, yes, no problem, because they want that out. Okay, so they talk to who they can trust, so don't break that trust with them. Don't rush. I mean... If you're like sitting there thinking, wow, I've got to get home, what am I going to have for dinner tonight or something like that, that's not the right time to talk to the kid. You, you really have to put everything else aside and focus on just the kid. Anticipate their fears, ask their understanding, um, straighten out misconceptions, give clear information, respect the parents' roles. This is a very tough one. If you have, like I said earlier, remember the ones where the parents say, don't tell the kid that they're dying? And the kid's like, I know that I'm dying. And you're like, how can I bridge these two? Okay, because part of you wants to say, the kid knows. We can help him through this process, okay, but the parents don't want to. They're still actually in charge. If you go and you tell the kid that they're dying, the parents say that they don't want you to tell them, you could actually get in a lot of trouble, okay? So what we do is we say, let's all get together and let's talk about this and the pros and cons, and you help them figure out why you would need to do this. Um, don't answer every question, but respond to all of them. That's probably one of my favorite things I said on there. That's the silence one is that, you know, silence is a response. Just sit there, okay? Sometimes a kid just wants you to sit and cry with them. It's okay. That's one of the things about with the death and dying and stuff. It's really interesting is that, you know, with the, uh, a lot of psychiatry, there's, there's like with the adult psychiatry, there's a lot of times where they, you know, you be stoic, don't always show your emotions and stuff like that. I think that's why I like child so much is that um, when I was in the hall earlier and I was going to get a cup of coffee and these patients were coming in to see one of my residents, and the kids run up and give me a big hug, and they say, hey, Dr. Matthews, and then they go back over and get their height and weight, and they go do their thing. And it's, a, it's neat because working with kids, you can actually show a little bit more of that emotion, but you have to very, be very much aware of think like a chess player. If I show this emotion, how is that going to impact this child? Is it going to be positive or is it going to be negative? And the trick is to be always consistent in your emotions. My kids know that I'm very consistent and stuff. And so they know that if I'm silent, They'll look like, what's going on? You okay? You know, kind of like, what's, why are you, that's usually, they know that that's going to be their cue that I'll sit here as long as you want until you talk. Okay? And um, so you just have to be able to understand the kids, but just be there for them. It's a really, really important thing. Uh, here's the big one. Like what I said earlier, examine your views and fears. Okay? If, if you have never experienced a loss like that, um, that doesn't mean you can't help the kids. Sometimes if a kid says, have you ever had somebody die? And if you lie to them and they find out, relationship completely gone. If you say, no, I haven't, then they may be like, oh, well, then you don't know what it's like. So how can you turn that around? You say, you're right. I haven't done that. Tell me what it's like because I have not experienced what you're going through. I want to hear because I need to know this so that I can help people in the future. Tell me what you're feeling. Tell me what you're going through. So you see how you can always kind of get it back focused on the kid. 
Uh, evaluates your ability to talk about it, recognize avoidance denial. Don't be afraid to show your emotions, okay? If you're afraid that you start crying, it's not gonna stop, then just be aware of that. One more picture there. So any questions with this? There you hear that? She said, do you, yeah. do you recommend using the words like death, dying, and things like that as opposed to using sleep, journey, loss, various things like that? Um, yeah, because what's going to happen is that those are the words they're going to use for the rest of their life. Death means death no matter whether you're 80 or you're 2. Okay? So you use the words. They may not understand it, and they may, not, they may get the understanding of it later on, but even though I say that, you use those words, but you also ask them, what do you want to call this? What is your understanding of this? And they may say, I want to call this, you know, something else. Like they may, saying the word death may bother them. So they may say like, let's call it banana, all right? And you know, and you're like, okay. So that could be the code word for death for them. But you ask what they want to use as their, what, what do they want to do? But you should use the words that are the words that we all use. What else? Anything else? Hey, sir. I work for Casa and mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we work with kids that have foster care. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those kids' parents have their rights terminated. Yep. Like that. Yes. Same thing to loss. Like I said, loss is loss. Mm -hmm. Any, anything else that might be more helpful than that? Because they might at some point see their parents. Just yeah, so, so it's, it's the... When you go through, even like even with young young kids, I go through the Kubler Ross stages, and I say, you know, there's the denial, the anger, the bargaining, and so I say it's okay to be angry, at mom and dad, okay? But you know, but you go to the next step and you say, but why? Why are you angry with them? What happened? What did they do? Um, and so you do the same things. You just don't use the word death. You just say, you know, they're not your parents anymore. But it's the exact the grieving process is the grieving process, and that's what's so amazing is that you can look at it if. A kid has a pet hamster that dies. You have a much smaller grieving process than if you have if a parent dies. But it's the same steps and process. One's just longer, one's shorter, and one's just more emotionally laden. So what I would say with something like that is you say, well, what happened and, and where are we going to go from there? Because then if you know that the parent's going to come back into their life, that's going to basically reopen. And I think sometimes that's harder than an actual death because what happens is it reopens those fears and those worries every time. Well, you know, they're not actually using these words, but like mom neglected me, so now if mom comes back, does that mean something else is gonna happen? An example of that is my family, there's seven kids in my family and five were adopted. My youngest sister, when we adopted her, um, she was two and a half, and when they came over here, they were completely malnourished. They had, you know, just their huge bellies because they were so malnourished and all that. They would not drink water because uh, they would be given Cokes, sodas, to go to bed at night. And so my mom would have to put Sweet and Low in water to get them to drink the water and stuff like that. So they would eat a meal, okay, and then they would kind of have a banana, like eat a huge meal because they were so used to not having food for so much of their life. So we were doing a trip. We were going to drive the whole family years ago. We were going to drive over to Disney World, all right? We're like, okay, let's all go. And then as soon as we get close to Georgia, she freaks out. I don't want to go there. We can't go through this state because that's, that's where I was where they have no food there. And so she was completely panicked. And it was one of those that we didn't even think about it, that for her, that was associated with the fear. So if you have a parent who'd been abusive to the kid, and then they say, well, let's try to get the rights back in, that may resurface all these fears and emotions that the kid had had before. So what you do is you talk about the process. Well, what had happened? What was going on? What would you do if you ever see your mom again? What would you ever do if you see your dad again? Would you be angry and you go through these different stages? Say so eventually you could forgive him or not. And so it's the same steps. You just use a little bit different words, and you'll be prepared that it will recur again if the family gets involved. So very long answer for, for that. Anything else? Yeah. Um, generally, more talks about cats Honestly, diagonally. Uh, she, she was asking about the, the, the two different ways of looking at it. Do kids go through the, the, 
grief process, kind of like with the kubler ross do they go through more horizontally, okay, or is it more of a vertical, like it happens kind of, you know, over time, or is it all occurring right at the same time? And in actuality, it's just, it's diagonal, because you never know which stage is going to happen when, how long it's going to take to get through one stage. It could be grieving for five years, it could be grieving for five months. So it's kind of not, it's better if you look at it on the thing, is that it's just sort of a, it's actually not even a diagonal, it's like a wavy line. And it's basically all based on the kid, because every kid is individual. And that's the thing, is that when you look at all these things, like even the Kubler-Ross, is that the, the reason I like those is because they're simple enough where each kid can interpret it for themselves, like, well, not the kid, but when you're working with a kid, you can interpret it how is best for that child, because no kid reads the book and no kid follows the rules about how they're gonna grieve, and everybody's a little different. So that's why it's kind of a tough thing to answer, because everybody is different. Yeah. What are your thoughts about open casket and kids of different ages going to open casket? We've kind of heard both things about that, but if, if they want to go, you should let them go, you should never let them go. Yeah, right? so I'll tell you a story about that. So when I was, maybe, I don't know, this is one of my vivid memories when I was maybe like eight, I think, um, my grandmother died. And when we were there, my dad's a child psychiatrist, so we're sitting there and we're at the back of the room and I'm like, I don't know, I don't know if we want to go up there. And, and um, we had the kids back there and there were two of the kids, my sisters, who were like, we don't want to go up there. And they were a little bit older, and they said, we want to remember how she was. We don't want to do that. Okay, but my brother and I were both in this, uh, you know, school age. What's it like? And so my dad says, do you want to go up? And we're like, I don't know, I don't know. And he's like, if you want to go up, I will take you up. But if you don't want to go up, I won't take you up. And so he gave us the choice. And so to this day, I remember that, that he gave me that choice to do that. So I go up, and he's like, well, go ahead and touch her. And I was like, what? So you touch. And I'm like, that's not grandma, because it's all, like, cold and rubbery. And I'm like, that's not grandma. And he's like, well, you know, exactly. Because I was like, her wrinkles are gone because, you know, the gravity had pulled everything down. And, and so for me, that was very helpful for me to be able to say, ah, I understand that. He didn't push my sisters to go see it. And they were very happy about that because they wanted to remember her the way they remembered her. But I can now remember her saying, ah, that wasn't my grandma. That was, that was just the shell. And now I have all my memories. So that's why it truly is. If you have anybody who ever says they should always go see them in an open casket, or they should never go see them, both of those groups are always wrong, okay? It's you ask the child, what do you want to do? And it depends on where that kid is in their stage, in, that, in their life at that point, whether or not they want to do it. One second. Go ahead. Uh, I was kind of thinking, I have a close friend who's going through a very early stages of what looking like uh, a but that decision hasn't been Kids probably are already somewhat aware of it. Well, exactly. I mean, kids are smart. They, they, the kids sense that. Really mommy, hard. why are you not nice to daddy? Or daddy, why are you not nice to mommy? They don't, they see that a certain way and then they see a different reaction. So what do you suggest one does when they're, she probably knows that they know. This is a chronic illness. That's what I was thinking. It's a chronic illness. It's towards something. But in the meantime, it's like. You do the exact same. Instead of doing if somebody, if something happens right away, like let's say there's an immediate divorce or an immediate death, then basically you do crisis stabilization and then you deal with the grief process, okay? So you get the grief going that way. If it's leading up to it like a divorce, then you're basically doing the grief process ahead of time and then as soon as a divorce happens, then it's crisis stabilization. Does that make sense? Yeah, but how do you do that with a kid if you're not really defining what it is? Okay. Yeah. 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 No, but it, it doesn't have to be like, we're going to get divorced. You can say, no, you know what? We've been arguing a lot, and we're just not getting along as well right now. And so, you know, sometimes when you have friends at school that you don't always get along with, sometimes you don't, maybe not, shouldn't play with them as much right then. So we're kind of taking a little break, and we're talking about this. I mean, things like that to define. It can still be gray, but define a little bit of it. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions on what to say or not say uh, for your nation, <sighs> give them the truth. Um, the if you look at a lot of the funeral homes here in town, they have really good information and stuff like that, and you can look at that when they talk about cremation. Teenagers want to know the facts; they want to know what really happens. Um, and if it's before somebody dies and somebody who wants to be cremated, then you actually have them ask the person, "Why do you want to be cremated?" Okay. Um, but they usually want to know more about the process and what does it mean. 
What's really hard sometimes for teenagers, especially with cremation, is that if the person is going to uh, uh, be cremated, sometimes then they worry that, well, then I'm not going to have anywhere to go see them. If you like, if you're going to scatter the ashes or whatever, and so if you have a teenager who they're going to have somebody cremated, say, well, what do you want? And if you actually go to most funeral homes and you look around, they actually will have like lockets that you can put ashes in. They have uh, uh, wind chimes that you can actually put some of the ashes in wind chimes. So every time you hear the wind chimes, you can, you know, you'll think. I mean, they have a million different things like that that they can actually do, and so get them informed about the process, and then they'll understand it. Um, you know, because everybody's view is different on cremation versus not cremation and stuff. And so all you do is you can get one of those fact sheets and say, well, let's look at it. This is just one process, one thing you can do. So is that it? Well, thank you all for coming. And we'll see you all in the new year at some point. <laughs>